The biopsychosocial framework is a functional model that looks at the interrelationship between biological, psychological and socio-cultural factors and how they contribute to our mental health and state of well-being. And we're going to apply this framework to the acquisition and treatment of phobias. We'll start with the definition of phobias is of course an intense and irrational fear of a specific object or situation. So let's look at biological contributing factors to the development of a phobia. So when we're exposed to our phobic stimulus, there's a physiological response, the fight-flight response is activated, HPA axis will lead to increase in adrenaline levels, our heart, heart rate will go up, blood pressure will increase, GSR will, will increase, etc. Now a biological explanation for an excessive physiological response to our phobic stimulus is a dysfunctional GABA system. GABA of course being the chief inhibitory neurotransmitter in the nervous system that counteracts the effects of the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the nervous system being glutamate. If we don't have a functional GABA system when we're exposed to our phobic stimulus then we're going to have an excessive physiological response to either exposure to our phobic stimulus or the thought of our phobic stimulus. Now we might have a dysfunctional GABA system because we've consumed too many psychedelic drugs or it could just be bad genetics. In terms of a biological treatment of a dysfunctional GABA system we take benzodiazepines which have an agonistic effect at the postsynaptic neuron by mimicking the effects of the GABA, e.g. we take Valium before we go on a plane flight or some Xanax, etc. Moving on to psychological contributing factors, we'll look at three models. We'll start with the psychodynamic theory, where Freud theorised that our phobias are the result of unresolved childhood conflicts that occurred during the phallic stage of psychosexual development. And these repressed thoughts that we have no waking access to affects our conscious behaviour, e.g. little hands, who through the Oedipus complex developed a phobia of horses, horses being a symbolic representation of his father. Now we could treat this with free association where we say, where we ask the patient to say whatever comes to mind and we look for recurring themes. We could then deal with the denial, the transference, etc. Alternatively, we could look at the behavioural model we could look at behaviour or phobias that have been classically conditioned. So let's say as a child you had an injection and there was a big allergic reaction to that, your arm puffed up, etc. And through that intense experience, that previously neutral stimulus of an injection or a syringe or side of a needle has become a conditioned stimulus which elicits a intense condition response, fear and anxiety. Or the phobia could have been caused by operant conditioning. So for instance, let's say you've got a child who, who likes getting a piggyback from her dad and maybe a dog runs up to the child in the park, the kid freaks out, the dad picks the kid up, she gets a piggyback from dad. She's getting positively reinforced. The phobia is being positively reinforced. So therefore, that's an example of phobias that have been operant conditioned. Or, thirdly, we could have the cognitive model where the patient has developed a cognitive bias. They might have a memory bias of an incident that occurred as a child where they only focus on, say, a negative experience that occurred during camping when there were floods or maybe a fire and forgetting all the good stuff that happened. Could be an attentional bias, so only noticing sort of key aspects in, re in relation to the phobic stimulus, well, it could be a interpretive bias. So let's say someone has a phobia of, stake, of snakes rustling in the bushes, might just be a bird or something. They might interpret that as a snake moving in for the kill. So now that we've looked at psychological causes of a phobia, let's look at psychological forms of treatment. We'll start with cognitive behavioural therapy, which is a talking therapy. In terms of the cognitive component, we look at triggers. What environmental circumstances lead to the fear or anxiety response? 
We get the patient to gather information about the phobic stimulus, whether it be heights, snakes, spiders, whatever. Find out how many people have been bitten by a spider, how many people have died, etc. And then in terms of the cognitive component, we teach the patient to reappraise the situation. So the triggers no longer manifest an intense phobic reaction. In terms of the behavioural component of CBT, we deal with the maladaptive behaviour, e.g. the avoidance. We look at get the patient to conduct behavioural experiments. So, for instance, if they have a fear of lifts, they have a fear of being caught in a lift, we get them to maybe stay outside a busy building, ground floor, and just spend a couple of hours there and see all the people who go in and out, make a hypothesis in terms of how often they think the lift will get stuck, and hopefully... After a couple of hours, there's been no lift breakdowns, people have gone up, people have gone down, etc. In terms of another, an alternative form of psychological treatment, we could use systematic desensitisation. I've already made a YouTube clip on this. It's a three-step process in which we teach the patient to use relaxation strategies. We get them to create a fear hierarchy. And then using step one and two in combination, they work through their fear hierarchy, starting at the bottom using their relaxation strategies until they can get their anxiety levels at an adaptive level. Alternatively, we could use the less effective flooding where we expose the patient to the phobic stimulus at the extreme and given that our allostatic systems are limited in how long they can maintain an intense phobic response in terms of our adrenaline levels, our heart rate, our blood pressure, eventually will run out of energy, the allostatic systems will run out of energy and the actual fear response, the anxiety levels will start to wane, they'll gradually reduce and we'll get used or conditioned to being exposed to our phobic stimulus at the extreme and then after a few hours of maybe being on the Rialto sky deck, let's say if we have a phobia of heights, we'll get that phobia to a more adaptive level in terms of our response. It's less effective than um, systematic desensitisation. And the final component of the biopsychosocial framework is the socio-cultural factors that contribute to the development of a phobia. We could have environmental triggers, we could have parental modelling. So let's say you have a parent who has a fear of heights as a young child, you might pay attention to their anxiety response when they're up high you might retain that information and then reproduce it when you become an adult yourself. Or we could have transmission of threat information. So, for instance, people might see a, a media article about people getting bitten by sharks off the west coast of Australia, which is happening at the moment, and next time they go to the ocean, they might become highly anxious about getting taken by a shark. 